Hello, my name is Todd Bridges, and I lead the Engineering with Nature initiative for the Army Corps of Engineers. I'd like to welcome you to our virtual launch event today for the International Guidelines on Natural and Nature-Based Features for Flood Risk Management. The guidelines provide technical information for practitioners, decision makers, and community members on how to conceptualize, plan, design, engineer, construct, operate, and in general use nature to help manage flood risks. Natural and nature-based features, or NNBF, are landscape features like beaches, dunes, wetlands, reefs, islands, and other features that can be used to produce, one, flood risk management benefits, and two, other economic, environmental, and social benefits, what we call co-benefits. The NMBF guidelines, all 1,000 pages of it, is the product of five years of work and collaboration across more than 70 government, private sector, nonprofit, and academic organizations from several countries who came together through working meetings, workshops, symposia, virtual events, to combine their knowledge and collective experience with using NNBF for flood risk management. Over these five years, more than 170 people from diverse backgrounds, technical disciplines, and experiences came together to share what they know and to collaborate on building the guidelines. And there is some urgency for maturing 21st century approaches to natural hazards, climate change, and flood risks. Flooding, both coastal and inland, is taking an increasing toll on communities across the globe. Natural disasters, of which flooding is a dominant type, produce $210 billion in damages and killed more than 8,000 people worldwide in 2020. In the U.S. in 2020, we experienced 22 weather or climate-related disasters that produced more than 260 deaths and $95 billion in damages. In 2021, we have seen flooding wreak havoc in Germany, Belgium, and the Netherlands. Hurricane Ida and the resulting storm system just two weeks ago resulted in more than 90 deaths and more than $50 billion in damages from Louisiana on the Gulf Coast and across the United States to New Jersey and New York in the Northeast. Addressing the growing and intensifying flood risk challenges around the world calls for new approaches and innovation in practice. We need to increase the portfolio of techniques, measures, and solutions that can be combined to build flood risk management systems and future resilience. With respect to the use of nature itself for flood risk management, the systems that will be built in the future will lie along a spectrum from wholly nature-based or natural to completely artificial. The vast majority of these future systems will include combinations of nature-based and conventional engineering, like the use of levees, dikes, and flood walls. The balance achieved in these systems between the natural and the artificial will be determined by a host of factors and conditions. The scope of flooding challenges worldwide calls loudly for creative, innovative, and diversified approaches. NMBF projects have been and are being successfully built around the world. The two published volumes of the Engineering with Nature atlases contain descriptions of some of these projects. Some successful examples of what today we call NNBF are as old as 100 years. And there has been a significant increase over many years in the availability of science-based evidence and technical information supporting how NMBF work and perform. The purpose of the NMBF guidelines is to draw this experience together and organize it as a tool, as guidance, for accelerating our collective progress in developing and implementing successful and sustainable 
flood risk management systems. This raises an important question about what kind of direction and guidance is needed for developing modern approaches to flood risk management and the use of NNBF. All of the agencies and organizations that have a role in the development of flood risk management systems will need to develop their own policies, supporting guidance and business processes to meet current and future needs. Different organizations have different authorities and mandates. As these organizations first look internally as to how they can and should contribute to progressing practice, they will also need to determine how they can collaborate and partner with other organizations across sectors to deliver 21st century infrastructure. One final point I'd like to make about guidance in general has to do with the difference between a cook and a chef. Personally, I can follow simple, explicit recipes in the kitchen and prepare a marginally acceptable meal. That's the extent of my capability. But I would suggest to you that the complexity and magnitude of flood risk challenges today cannot be fully addressed by following a cookbook of simple recipes. By contrast, chefs apply their knowledge of food science and their skill in the culinary art to truly create in order to satisfy. Nature holds tremendous value. By effectively integrating nature into flood risk management, I believe we can create stronger, more enduring infrastructure systems that reduce flood risks while enriching our communities with the diversity of value that nature provides. Collaboration and partnership are levers for progress. It is now my honor to introduce a series of messages from leaders from some of the key partner organizations who join together to build the guidelines. Lieutenant General Scott Spellman, 55th Chief of Engineers and Commanding General, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Dr. Richard Spinrad, Administrator of the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Ms. Michelle Blum, Director General of the Rijksraderstaat in the Netherlands. Mr. Sama Waba, Global Director of Urban Disaster Risk Management, Resilience and Land Global Practice at the World Bank. Ms. Caroline Douglas, Executive Director for Flood and Coastal Risk Management in the Environment Agency in the UK. I am Lieutenant General Scott Spellman, 55th Chief of Engineers and Commanding General of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. I'm here at Stony Point, New York, along the Hudson River, just downstream from the United States Military Academy at West Point, New York. We say our vision in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is to engineer solutions for our nation's toughest challenges. Given the complexities of our multi-hazard world, we must innovate to revolutionize our approach to infrastructure development. The USACE Engineering with Nature program is one expression of our organizational commitment to innovation. Through the Engineering with Nature program, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and our partners around the world have been working for five years to develop international guidelines on the use of natural and nature-based features for flood risk management. I am proud of what this team and partnership has accomplished in reaching this day. Relationships and partnerships are vital to innovation and progress and these guidelines were achieved because of strong relationships across organizations in the public and private sectors in countries around the world were put to work in order to make progress. We've joined forces across missions, perspectives, mandates, and experience to share lessons and best practices for partnering with nature in delivering sustainable, resilient infrastructure solutions for flood risk management. More than 180 contributors and authors from 77 organizations came together as a team to develop these guidelines to support government agencies, the private sector, planners, engineers, local communities, and policymakers to develop sustainable solutions 
that reduce the economic and human toll produced by coastal and inland flooding around the world. We need productive partnerships like this one to accelerate progress in developing and delivering infrastructure solutions for our communities and countries. And I look forward to seeing these guidelines applied by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and our partners as we work to engineer with nature everywhere we can. So to the many who contributed to this effort, I want to thank you for all of the heavy lifting and hard work that you have put forward. I look forward to implementing these guidelines in core projects across the country. Thank you for all you do. SAONs, Army Strong, Building Strong. Hi, I'm Rick Spinrad, the Undersecretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere and the Administrator of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. I want to thank the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers for inviting me to participate in today's event. Consistent with the President's Executive Order on Climate Change, NOAA is committed to providing authoritative science information and tools to help communities and decision makers across the nation adapt to a changing climate, improve resilience, manage and conserve ocean, coastal, and Great Lakes ecosystems, all through a strong lens of social equity for vulnerable communities. That's why it's an honor for me to represent NOAA in support of the Army Corps' newly published International Guidelines on Natural and Nature-Based Features for Flood Risk Management. The complex challenges of sea level rise, coastal flooding, increased storm frequency, and other hazards pose increasing risks to our nation's communities and natural resources. In the last five years, weather, and climate-related disaster events have cost our nation over $630 billion in damages. U.S. coastlines are now experiencing twice as many high tide flooding events compared to just 20 years ago. In fact, 80% of NOAA's tide gauges have recorded accelerated increases in high tide flooding. A significant portion of the nation is increasingly vulnerable to these hazards, given that 40% of the U.S. population lives in coastal counties, and that population is projected to increase. Coastal communities whose economies are dependent on natural resources will feel a disproportionate impact of these hazards, which threaten not just property, but their livelihoods as well. Solutions that reduce the impact of these hazards, while also addressing the demands on the use of our natural resources for commerce, food, energy, recreation, and conservation, will require innovative methods and approaches that cannot be solely addressed through the use of traditional hardened infrastructure. Natural features are more capable of adapting to a changing environmental condition and being self-sustaining, while conventional infrastructure can have less capacity to meet future climate conditions. This is why the Army Corps-led effort to develop international guidelines that advance the use of natural and nature-based features is so important. The guidelines equip natural resource managers, decision makers, project planners, and practitioners with solutions that reduce flood and storm risks while providing jobs, preserving commerce and recreation, improving resilience, and producing more environmentally sustainable outcomes. For example, by using natural features such as marshes, dunes, reefs, islands, and mangroves to protect coastal communities, we can also improve habitats that support commercially and recreationally important species and enhance opportunities for aquaculture. In addition, the guidelines can modernize the regulatory review process by promoting such projects that integrate coastal protection and benefits to habitat and endangered species. These approaches align with my belief and one of my top strategic priorities that we can be good stewards of the environment while also enabling powerful economic growth in an equitable manner. Our national discussion on infrastructure investment must incorporate the elements of sustainability to provide fully for the health, welfare, economic vitality, and socially just climate resilience of our coastal communities. I am delighted that NOAA has served as a partner on this international five-year multi-agency effort. The magnitude of this partnership is impressive and is reflected in the depth of knowledge and information that's been compiled in the guidelines document. Partnerships like this produce actionable and meaningful guidance and decision support that will be key to meeting the multifaceted global challenges that we all face. 
as we build back better, leveraging the inherent power of nature will provide sustainable and cost-effective benefits to our economies, the environment, and society. Congratulations to the Army Corps and its Engineering with Nature initiative, as well as to all of the partner organizations on this landmark publication. I look forward to NOAA continuing to participate in collaborative efforts like this and helping to implement these approaches in the U.S. and abroad. By working together, we can make the world a better place for people and nature. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank the organization for the opportunity to speak to you today as Director General of Rijkswaterstaat on this very important topic. As you may know, Rijkswaterstaat is the executive agency of the Dutch Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management. We are constantly working on a safe, sustainable and accessible living environment, together with our national and international partners. And we are very glad to have a long and close cooperation with the United States Army Corps of Engineers and the English Environment Agency. And it was within this international network we decided to bundle our experiences with natural and nature-based solutions in a very open setting together with many partners. And today we're together to celebrate the launch of this international handbook. In the Netherlands we've already been working for many years with nature-based solutions to defend ourselves against floods. And it's just two months ago that in the German, Belgian and Dutch border region we experienced a record rainfall event. Sadly enough, this resulted in almost 200 lives lost in Germany and Belgium. Overall damages are estimated in the order of 10 billion euros. And in the Netherlands, the River Meuse displayed a record high water discharge in a time of the year, summer, that we never believed that it ever would. Fortunately, we carried out major river widening works over the last 25 years. And these clearly prevented a lot of damage and no lives, luckily, were lost in the Netherlands. But these extreme and increasingly occurring events also show us that we should not weaken our efforts to keep our feet dry. We can't continue to just fight the water. Instead, we have to find new ways to live with water as a society. And I firmly believe that nature-based solutions are the most important approach to adapt and protect ourselves to these threats. And this international handbook isn't only an account on how to do a better job. It's also very timely. It provides systematic insights on how to prepare, to plan, to realize and to maintain and improve flood security. And I strongly support all partners who worked on the handbook to continue developing, sharing, discussing, learning from each other in this excellent community of practice. I wish you all joy, wisdom and inspiration while reading these guidelines. Good morning um, and congratulations to all the partners for finalizing the international guidelines on natural and nature-based features for flood risk management. Now, nature-based solutions are an important tool for the World Bank to reduce the mounting flood risk and to build climate resilience. Communities and governments globally are challenged by the increasing frequency and severity of flooding, whose impacts are exacerbated by climate change. And it's always the poor and the most vulnerable who are the most uh, affected by uh, flooding and therefore have to be adapting to the changing climate. In fact, in many areas, mounting flood risk goes hand in hand with rapid urbanization. Much of it is unplanned and the loss of natural ecosystems are also critical for sustaining livelihoods, hence the worsening impact on the poor. Now, we cannot afford to see climate change, urbanization and the loss of nature as different and independent processes because they all contribute to these rising risks. Therefore, effectively addressing flood risk will require that we use integrated approaches to harness natural and nature-based features, to strengthen climate resilience, and to protect natural areas and secure development gains. 
At the World Bank's global practice for urban resilience and land, we are strengthening our capacity to deliver more and better nature-based solutions projects to our clients. So within our portfolio, investment in nature-based solution to manage the flooding and other natural hazards has been on the rise. In fact, the past three years have seen a significant increase and our portfolio today stands at about $4.9 billion. To further strengthen our capacity, the World Bank and the Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery, GFDRR, have recently launched a global program on nature-based solutions for climate resilience. This program basically serves as a repository, uh, an expertise hub within the World Bank, which also is intended to strengthen our external partnerships to ensure that we have the best tools and knowledge at our disposal when we're working in operation. The global program is supporting our operational teams on the ground, engaging with client countries to advance nature-based solutions on different fronts, whether it's the technical support, the capacity building, the policy development, and the finance. Now, a couple of examples from our portfolio. In Colombo, the capital of Sri Lanka, we are financing investments in urban wetland. So this is meant to help safeguard the community because climate impacts are intensifying. And this uh, wetland protection and restoration scheme, uh, together with, of course, conventional flood control approaches uh, are being utilized. In the city of Beira in Mozambique, the World Bank and the government of Germany have jointly financed the creation of one of the largest urban parks in Africa, which serves as a nature-based solution, both to fight urban flooding, but also to improve the livelihood of uh, vulnerable citizens. Lastly, in the Seychelles, we are supporting the government with coastal management, planning, integrating nature-based and gray infrastructure solutions. And we're also exploring the feasibility of investment in coral reef management. Now, the international guidelines on natural and nature-based features for flood risk management present a comprehensive foundation for integrating nature-based flood risk management in overall investments. Because despite the great progress we've had in nature-based solutions, we know that there are gaps in knowledge, whether it's for the identification, the design, or the operation of these types of solutions. Hence, the guidelines provide a framework for incorporating nature-based solutions in engineering projects, and they also provide key principles and approaches for stakeholder management, systems thinking, adaptive management, and also economic analysis. The guidelines consolidate a growing body of literature on the use of specific nature-based features for managing flood risk, such as reefs, wetlands, beaches, and dunes. So we see great potential for these guidelines to become a standard technical guidance for nature-based solution feasibility and design studies implemented by both our client governments and our contractors. And the guidelines together with the ongoing collaboration with the Engineering with Nature Partnership will support also capacity building to spread the word on natural and nature-based solutions. Lastly, for the World Bank, partnerships are critical to advance our capacity to take nature-based solution to scale within our resilience portfolio. So the guidelines will bring this expertise and experience uh, as they have been developed of 175 experts from over 30 partner organizations that are leading the work. These ongoing collaborations and knowledge sharing with key partners, including the US Army Corps of Engineers, Dutch Rijkswaterstaat, NOAA, and the UK Environment Agency, will be critical to build capacity in the World Bank for scaling up nature-based solutions. Lastly, we'd like to really congratulate and thank the US Army Corps of Engineers for leading the effort and all the partners for their fantastic contributions. We look forward to working with all the partners on the implementation of the guidelines in projects all over the world to strengthen resilience for the most vulnerable and to bring about the full breadth of benefits that nature-based solutions can deliver. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Caroline Douglas, Executive Director of Flood and Coastal Risk Management, the Environment Agency in England. The Environment Agency, we're here to create a better place for people and wildlife. Part of that is addressing flood and coastal erosion risk. 
a flood and coastal erosion risk management strategy has the ambition of being a nation ready for and resilient to flood and coastal change today, tomorrow and out to 2100. This means that we need to work with partners, creating climate resilient places, and ensure we make the right investment and planning decisions to secure sustainable growth and environmental improvements, and ensure local people and communities understand the risks that they face and know when and what they need to do to take action. We can't keep building ever far higher flood defences. It isn't practical and construction and operation of flood assets can emit a lot of carbon. They also have the potential to have a detrimental impact on habitats and ecosystems. Natural and nature-based solutions provide an opportunity to reverse the decline in our environment that we have caused over generations, to restore and protect it, with the added benefit of reducing flood risk. Typically, these measures cost less than hard engineering options and can be more sustainable. When combined with hard engineering solutions, they can have the effect of reducing the size and lengthening the lifespan of these hard engineering options. They may also help to keep pace with climate change. Throughout our catchments, or watersheds as they are called in the United States, there is a range of nature-based solutions and interventions we can use, such as habitat restoration, woodlands and trees, and leaky barriers, to name just a few. The Engineering with Nature Partnership continues to be a great collaboration between a range of international organisations and the Environment Agency is proud to be a part of it. The shared learning, understanding and guidance has been key to help it, helping us all achieve our ambitions. These relationships are strong and sustainable, built on mutual trust, compromise and willingness to listen. These partnerships are critical to achieving great out outcomes with nature-based solutions. COP26 later this year, is focusing on nature-based solutions. And while they do contribute to flood risk and the climate emergency, they also help to address the ecological crisis we are facing. 25-year environment plan here in the United Kingdom aims to improve our environment over a generation, and our flood strategy is a key part of this. The science we are using is not new. I saw some of it in action over 25 years ago. However, we need to continue to learn. Water is a precious resource whether too much or too little, and we need to work with nature to value the resource and protect lives and livelihoods into the future. I want, I want to thank these leaders for their remarks, for their support and encouragement, and for the forewords they provided that are included in the guidelines. It's now my honor and pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Ms. Anita Van Breda, who is the Senior Director for Environment and Disaster Management at the World Wildlife Fund. WWF is one of the world's largest environmental nonprofit organizations and, it is, and is active in nearly 100 countries and has 5 million plus supporters across the world. WWF has been an important partner and collaborator in developing the NNBF guidelines. It's been a true pleasure to get to know Anita and to work with her and her colleagues at WWF over the last several years. Anita, I'm very much looking forward to hearing your thoughts about NNBF and the guidelines, please. Thank you, Todd. I am neither a cook or a chef, so I'm not sure if these comments are going to resonate, but I will do my best. Um, it's a great honor to be a part of this event. These guidelines have been a long time in the making. It's a huge effort, and I congratulate you, Jeff, Courtney, and the whole team for your creativity, dedication, and tenacity in pushing this across the finish line in a global pandemic. Next slide. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with WAF, we are a conservation organization and our mission is to conserve nature and reduce the most pressing threats to the diversity of life on Earth. Next. Our work is centered around these six primary goals with approximately 6,000 staff around the world and my team 
as part of our climate goal. And it may not be common knowledge that as a conservation organization, we also work on disasters, but I launched this program in 2005 with the Indian Ocean tsunami and it's grown in scale and scope ever since. Over the years, I've learned that um, nature can be a fundamental part of reducing disaster risk, and it's also a critical element to a successful recovery when extreme events do take place. We've built our disaster work around three primary pillars. One is our green recovery and reconstruction initiative. Second is our flood management program. And thirdly, we work on infrastructure related issues. And of course, not all flooding is bad. Uh, it is a natural part of many parts of landscapes. And we derive many benefits from floods in terms of improving soil fertility by depositing nutrients and removing sediments from water bodies. So the goal should not be to stop all floods in every instance, but we also know as our speakers have already confirmed that it, in a clear way that there are many factors that are coming together to create new or exasperate existing flood risks. And as these guidelines also confirm, there's a clear and a growing need to think of flood risk management in a different way one where nature and natural processes can be a part of the solution. And we've tried to contribute to this space with our flood green guide that we launched in 2017, also based on natural and nature-based approaches. And it's through the development of those guidelines that we had the good fortune to meet Todd and his colleagues and learn about the development of the NNBF guidelines that we're here to launch today. Um, and here we are hard at work in that process. And I was fortunate to be a member of the community engagement chapter team led so ably by Maria Dillard, who we will hear from later today. Next slide, please. And looking at the table of contents of the guidelines and seeing the photo of the writing team, uh, here we are in Scotland a number of years ago, that got me to thinking about diversity. Next slide. And of course, as an environmentalist, I think about biodiversity a lot um, and how biodiversity of nature and the natural world has allowed us to survive and thrive as a species. Next slide. And what I find so fascinating about flood manage management is the diversity of issues that flood management touches upon. There's issues of geography, geology, hydrology, as well as engineering, legal issues, political issues, policy issues, financial, communication, any number of factors go into decision making about flood management. So naturally there are a lot of, and a variety of approaches and guidelines and standards for flood management. Next slide. And societies and government leaders may determine different flood management objectives depending on the geography of the place. So in a rural area, if we're trying to protect farms and farming systems or suburban communities where we're looking to protect homes and families, maybe different objectives than what we have in a developed urban center. Next slide. And that brings us to the range and diversity of approaches and methods available to us at different scales, where nature can be a fundamental part of addressing flood risk. In some cases, as has been mentioned, nature alone will be sufficient. And in many cases, we will need to work in combinations with nature and other methods. Next slide. There have been people dealing with flood risk for probably as long as there have been people wandering around the planet. My parents came to the United States from as immigrants from the Netherlands, and I grew up hearing from my grandmother and others about the great 1953 flood that launched the development of the Dutch Delta Works, a great feat of engineering, but also a great feat of mobilization of a whole society approach. And for a long time, and in most countries around the world, flood management was primarily focused on engineering. Next slide. But as the great philosopher Yogi Berra said, the future ain't what it used to be. 
So in the future, I think we're still going to need engineers and engineering, um, but I think it's becoming increasingly clear in terms of flood management that we can't keep doing the same thing in the same way. And so these guidelines will help move us in a direction that includes nature. Next slide. There are so many diverse co-benefits of including nature in our flood risk management approach. So for example, combining forestry and agriculture in upper watersheds, as this photo from Nepal demonstrates, provides soil conservation, improving infiltration and reducing runoff. We can use rain gardens in public spaces and on our city streets also to reduce runoff, but we get the co-benefits of quality of life improvement and recreational uh, opportunities. In urban areas, we can use green roofs and other methods that help us manage runoff, but can also provide other benefits like space for growing food. Next slide. But if we are to adapt the traditional and conventional engineering for flood management, I think we're going to need different experiences and expertise as part of that process. Next slide. So all of the expertise and experiences represented in the many chapters of the guidelines we're launching today and more will be required to address the scale and scope and complexity of growing flood risk around the world. And what will help us to adapt is diversity of lived experiences. These guidelines were developed by a number of people, several different organizations in multiple countries, which has been fantastic. But I want to encourage us all to continue to develop diverse teams. I think we need to bring more women into this world. We need more experiences from other parts of the globe beyond North America and Europe. And we should not underestimate, in my view, the power of engaging with young people. Youth are the future professionals, the future decision makers, the future leaders in community, leading community engagement. And so if we engage them across their academic and professional careers, they can help speed up the change that we need to see. We've been trying to do this in our modest flood management program, but we would like to do better in that process. And we would like to work with all of you as part of transforming flood management. Next slide. And although guidelines are absolutely critical, in my view, we need to help people put these great guidelines to use and train the next generation of practitioners. There are many who want to be involved, who are excited, energetic, and ready to change the world. Many of them look to North America and Europe for ideas and expertise. So I hope that we can all work together to expanding our reach and including different voices. I know that there are many participants from our past trainings who are listening and watching today, and I know that they are eager to use these guidelines where they live. So finally, that brings me to the way forward. And at the end of the day, when all the workshops are complete and all the chapters are written, we need to go out there and we need to do it. We need to be creative, we need to be innovative, and we need to continue to learn. And so I'm delighted that this group of hardworking people has committed to staying together, continue to learn, and move from what already complex, difficult flood management context we live in to what will surely be the challenging future. So again, Todd, I congratulate you and the entire team. Thank you for this valuable contribution to adjusting our sales. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anita, for those really thoughtful and timely remarks. I, I too firmly believe that one of the benefits that we must pursue from guidelines is to expand engagement um, and conversation and to draw others across the world into this discussion about what sustainable management of, of our cities and our infrastructure and our place in the environment, what that really looks like. And I, I have to say on a personal note, it's been a pleasure getting to know you and to work with you and getting to know and to work with 
WWF, and I'm really looking forward to the future of more engagement and more partnership with you and the organization. Thank you very much today. Thank you, Todd. Next in our program of live TV <laughs> is a panel discussion with some leaders and authors who contributed to the development of the guidelines. I will introduce the panel members now, which you are beginning to see before you. And I would ask you all to uh, identify yourselves maybe with a short wave, but Hans Peterson, where's Hans? There he is, there he is. Hans Peterson is a senior advisor with the Rijkswaterstaat in the Netherlands. Hans helped shape, in fact, the guidelines project and is a co-author of our chapter on community engagement. Maria Dillard, you're there. There you are. Maria Dillard is a social scientist with the U.S. National Institute of Standards and Technology. Maria was, in fact, the lead author of our chapter on community engagement. Candace Piercy, Candace, there. Candace Piercy is a research engineer with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Candace was a lead author on two chapters, an overachiever uh, in the guidelines, a uh, chapter on NNBF performance, and the chapter on wetlands. Steve Thur, Steve, there, Steve. Steve Thur is a senior executive with the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, whose team members played many key roles in the development of the guidelines. Joe Guy, Joe. Joe Guy is an environment and sustainability manager with the Environment Agency in England. Joe and the Environment Agency played an important part in shaping the guidelines project. Joe has played a lead role and was an author uh, of our chapters on fluvial or riverine applications of NNBF. Lizzie McLeod, Lizzie, wave. Lizzie leads the Nature Conservancy's global work on reefs and she has, was a lead author on our chapter on reefs. The Nature Conservancy as a, another environmental uh, nonprofit organization operating around the world was an important partner in the NMBF uh, guidelines effort. And finally, uh, Brendan Youngman, uh, Brendan, there he is, is at the World Bank's Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery, GFDRR. From that position, he leads the bank's uh, global program on nature-based solutions for climate resilience. And the World Bank was a valuable partner and contributor to the development of the guidelines. Welcome, everyone. I'd like to start by uh, posing a, a question to Hans Peterson with the Reichswaterstadt. Hans, the Reichswaterstadt and the Army Corps of Engineers have a long and productive history of collaboration. And as you and I have discussed, we our two agencies share uh, similar histories as infrastructure organizations. I'd like to ask you to comment on the importance of international cooperation, collaboration across sectors as an ingredient for fueling progress on advancement in infrastructure practice, particularly nature-based solutions or approaches within infrastructure. Please share your thoughts, Hans. Thank you very much, uh, Todd. Um, well, first of all, I think I have to thank you for your enthusiasm and your diligence to bring these guidelines to the stage where it is now. And as Anita said, this is just, uh, I would say, an in-between mark, but and we will continue as a community of practice working on this uh, topic. Well, now for the international cooperation, yeah, being a small country like the Netherlands at the end of major rivers, it's a no brainer that we have to work together. Um, since 20 years, we have European guidelines, which um, force us to work together in a watershed manner. Uh, we share with Germany and Denmark, uh, barrier islands in the North, which are UNESCO uh, protected UNESCO heritage sites. Um, and we did a little bit of research in our own organization, about 10% of the 9,000 people we employ is active internationally and the the main reason for that is that we don't have all the knowledge um, we live in a in a densely populated country where 
by definition, almost every infrastructure in, uh, undertaking is a complex one involving many stakeholders, um, involving the ingenuity of contractors and knowledge institutes. So you have to work together. Uh, and internationally, um, it acts a bit as a mirror to our experts and practitioners, because you have to be able to um, explain and discuss your approach to, you could say an international panel of peer reviewers, write it down, so I think um, if you look back on this particular effort in putting down these guidelines, it has been extremely beneficial for um, those colleagues who actually actively contributed to it. Um, so um, I would say we did it and we should absolutely continue to do so, working internationally. Yeah, Th thank you, Hans. I, I, I of course agree, and this has been a point that's already been made, but there's much that we can learn from others, um, especially in the context of such a, a broad and complex problem as flooding. And, and I think we are certainly committed to that idea and we look forward to working with you and the Reichswater Stud and the other organizations uh, in this endeavor. Maria Dillard, uh, Maria, as I said, and I understand, you know, you are a social scientist by training and in and, and practice and work with the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And you were the lead author on our chapter in the guidelines on community engagement. So I, and I know that you work in this area actively. And so I would like to ask you to describe from your point of view, really the basis for the increasing importance of meaningful substantive engagement with communities on infrastructure projects. Thanks, Todd. Um, I I think we we all want to to start with the acknowledgement that that community engagement has always been important, but I think the the field of practice more broadly has really pushed to to emphasizing a new type of of engagement that much more explicitly makes partners of the, the stakeholders and those who, who are impacted by a potential project or, or may be part of determining and identifying the solutions that may work in, in their community and for their particular needs. And so in the, the guidelines, one of the things that we, we try to encourage is this much deeper, much more in meaningful level of engagement acknowledging that it's challenging and that it requires a great deal of effort and that there's a lot of complexity in this. Um, but in order to, to have the, the solution types that we're most interested in really rise to, to the top and also to see um, natural and nature-based features as, as a viable option, we really want to engage a much broader set of voices in the discussion about how to deal with with various natural hazard risks, including flooding, um, and and really understand what are the the potential benefits and what are the um, the gains that we might might make by by considering these uh, natural and nature based feature solutions. So I I think it's. It's always been an important piece, and and we're we're merging um, towards a, a larger kind of international acceptance of the value, and that the the pros really outweigh all of the challenges in in doing this this more um, substantial engagement. Yeah, th thank you very much for that response, Maria. I, I guess I'll I'll key in just on the the point you made about you know time and effort. This is not something on the side, <laughs> you know, it really does require commitment in very tangible forms of time and effort. And, and I think this is, from my perspective, another area where we can learn from one another in these experiences of, of making this kind of additional effort at this kind of engagement. That's, a, I think, a very exciting area of work, this intersection between communities and the technical, if you will, practice of developing infrastructure. I appreciate the leadership of NIST and your work in this area. We look forward to engaging more on it. Thank you, Maria. 
Thank um, you. Candace Piercy, Candace, uh, I've already noted you're an engineer and oh. you were an author of two of our chapters. And I'm going to focus in on the chapter on performance of NNBF. Engineering performance is an important topic. Uh, projects have to perform functions in order to be judged successful. Uh, what key takeaways would you like to highlight for the audience today about performance and natural nature-based features? Thank you for the question, Todd. Um, the performance of NNBF really mirrors the performance of our conventional infrastructure. We, we shouldn't be thinking about it in any sort of different way that, um, than what we do with, uh, with our traditional levees, flood walls, et cetera. However, the performance of NNBF has one key difference is the biological component that makes up NNBF also needs to perform similarly. So you can't just focus on whether or not the NNBF stays in place during a storm or during a flood, if it actually reduces water levels, we also need to make sure that it is um, appropriately functioning outside of those, those periods. For instance, uh, one of the key factors in whether or not a wetland is going to perform as designed is whether or not it is healthy before the storm rolls in. Um, a lot of the wetlands that were damaged as part of her during Hurricane Katrina actually were stressed for a long period of time, and that storm served as the tipping point. Um, so we really need to focus on making sure the entire NNBF is functioning, and um, one and that will also allow it to adapt as conditions change, as we see increasing um, increasing temperatures, increasing salinity, increasing sea level, um, these, these features can, can adapt and can, uh, and can um, self-maintain if we manage them appropriately. And I think that's one of the key distinctions that will allow NNBF to play a role in maintaining um, flood risk management in our very uh, built up coastal and riverine settings into the future. Thanks, Candace, for that that response. I think it it is uh, consistent in broad terms with with uh, conventional engineering that you know kind of this monitoring attention to the kind of the health of the system. But maybe I would sum up what you said in this way. You know, if we care for nature, nature will care for us. And and I think understanding what NMBF are and that NMBF are natural, we, we have to consider that entire system as a part of the performance of it in the future. So thank you for that, Candace. Steve Thur, Steve, uh, NOAA and the Corps of Engineers have a productive collaboration going on uh, for, with engineering, with nature, and advancing practice together, actually. And when we think about the ingredients of full-scale implementation of nature-based solutions, interagency collaboration and partnership really is at the top of the list of must-haves from my point of view. What does this level of partnership look like in the future from your perspective? And, and how do we get there to that level of partnership? Thanks, Todd. Uh, so I see three conditions necessary for future partnership success. Uh, the first is that we simply need an expanded partner pool. Raising awareness of nature-based solutions is a precondition for that expanded pool, and these NNBF guidelines are one way to raise that awareness. An additional step would be to adopt a matchmaker mindset. So if we reframe our view from who can I partner with, to who in my network can I connect with others, the partner pool is going to expand very rapidly. And when this occurs, my network becomes your network, and, and that's going to help tremendously. Second, um, I think we need to understand each partner's motivations, goals, and limitations. I think in three-dimensional Venn diagrams, and if I truly understand and embrace your organization's sphere in that three-dimensional diagram, 
I'm going to be much more likely to see how we can find solutions of mutual interest. So embracing my partner's motivations and their limitations is going to help me shift from lamenting the barriers that may otherwise be imposed to focusing on how to work within all the partner's constraints for mutual benefit. And the third, I think we need to recognize that projects designed for a single purpose will increasingly not be the optimal societal solution. In the case of projects for mitigation of flood risk, when we view it narrowly based on a single legal mandate, one solution might appear efficient. However, if we remove those blinders imposed by that legal mandate, it might become obvious that there are alternate solutions that are better for society as a whole. So perhaps a nature-based solution may become socially optimal if we consider additional roles that we have as society, like restoring threatened endangered species, providing for recreation, fisheries production, maintenance of biodiversity or carbon sequestration. So Todd, my three recommendations are to expand the partner pool, enhance and embrace the motivations, goals, and limitations of our partners, and to change our perspective away from a single goal focus. Yeah, thank, thank you, Steve, for that. And, you know, to kind of combine a bit, you know, with what you were saying with, with what Maria was talking about, you know, making the community a partner in the effort, there, it's kind of easy to think that, you know, partnership, oh, that's easy. There's, there's really nothing easy about partnership. And, and, and it's maybe the terms like, you know, whole of government approach, they kind of just roll right off the tongue, but that, that, there's a lot in that. It, a lot of thoughtful effort and energy has to be put into it. And, and you and I have talked many times about this and I'm so pleased at, at, about what we're doing, the core and NOAA together in engineering with nature. And I, I think we can do more. And then, as you say, we can embrace each other's networks to accomplish even more in that regard. So I thank you very much for the response. Uh, Joe Guy, appreciate you being with us today, Joe, from, from the UK. You know, the, the United Kingdom and the United States, we have a special relationship, you know, for many reasons. And the project to develop the guidelines benefited a great deal from learning about the Environment Agency and your partners work in this space of natural flood management or nature-based solutions, your specific projects, which we were able to visit, um, and, and the contributions of several team members from the Environment Agency during the building of the guidelines. So I, I'm gonna ask you a question somewhat similar to, to the question I asked to Hans, but you know, how do you think we can sustain and, and even grow our knowledge sharing on nature-based approaches, you know, agency to agency and, and even beyond that? Thanks, uh, Todd. It's um, been uh, a real uh, privilege and enjoyment actually for the agency to work with the natural and nature-based features uh, project. And, and I expect it will carry on for some time as, as yet. Um, I think the answer to your question, probably could, I could touch on by using four words and then I'll try and explain them. So I'd say benefits, sharing, sustaining, and growing are the four words I'd, I'd choose. And then we'll step through each one of those. So, so the benefits, now the benefits of pieces of work like this go way beyond the actual document that we produce, the learning we provide to others. Um, it generates and provides for all those organisations amazingly broad networks. Now, those networks aren't just related to the people who are involved in it, because very often you have a, um, a phone my friend issue or a question. So someone will say, how do I do this? And you say, I know someone or someone will say to you, phone that person, they'll tell you who to speak to. And so we can reach out and use our global networks to do that. And all of those organizations can share that. And that's already going on now, and I think we'll continue to. Um, it also means that we have uh, an ability to seek others' experiences and to understand where they might be doing similar things. And, and that allows us, as, as a group of organizations and partners, to understand what's worked somewhere else and, and sometimes what else hasn't worked. So it allows that massive ability to um, learn from others' experiences and, and that is just 
you know, a uh, huge benefit of this whole work. The second word I was going to talk about was was sharing. And I think really that th this is where, you know, the agency, the environment agency has been really pleased to be able to share internationally the work that it's done on fluvial or river iron systems, what we'd call our working with natural processes work. And that's there in a number of the uh, fluvial chapters and also our, our, our ability to share our experience around community engagement and uh, coasts and dunes where we've contributed to, the, to those um, chapters. Uh, and then the, the third thing you asked me was, was well, the third word I was going to uh, talk about, and, and you mentioned it, sustain. How, how do we sustain that activity? Well, um, I think that those... Uh, that the guidelines it provides ways for, for the agency, for the rice water staff, for all of those organisations that have been involved, and more importantly, their partners, to share their work across an international audience. And that's really powerful because it allows us to demonstrate and for others to show our demonstration to the people they work with, to say, look, NMBF is being used and it's being used successfully. And that becomes a really strong tool to further its use elsewhere. And then finally, the, the, you asked me about grow. Well, I think, um, I think we have an uh, amazingly strong ability now to start to grow what we learn here and apply it elsewhere. So, for example, we are all now looking at the net zero issue that we're going to have to deal with in order to deal with the climate emergency. We can see from the experience that we have had from doing this piece of work, that there are techniques and thoughts going on elsewhere. And so, for example, our desire to use salt marshes and others' desire to use salt marshes for sequestration of carbon means that we're able to reach out. And so, for example, there's a, a US code on sequestration capability from salt marsh, and that's something we can learn from and share more widely. It stops us thinking individually and allows us to learn from others. So you ask me my, my four words, they would be, it's the benefits, it's the sharing, it's that sustaining of our experiences and it's being able to grow what we do to increase our understanding of NBF and its application. Yeah. Thank you very much, Joe, for, for that response. And yeah, I'm going to pick a word from what you said. This, this word of network, um, an organization or even a, an individual professional's capability is a direct function of the robustness of their network. And, and a network has to be constantly tended, you know, and, and shepherded, if you will, along the way. And, uh, I, and we've had these discussions within our NMBF community in the guidelines many times that there's so much value in the community that came together to develop the guidelines. We really have to continue, if you will, mining that value from that community uh, in the future. So thank you very much, uh, Joe, and thank you to the Environment Agency for being such valuable partners in the effort. Next up, uh, Lizzie McCloyd. Lizzie, you were the one of the lead authors on our chapter on reefs as flood risk management uh, features. You work for the Nature Conservancy, a large international nonprofit. What opportunities do you see for nonprofits, industry, and government to work together to advance nature-based flood risk management around the world. And, um, and thanks to everybody for being here and tuning in today. Um, I think the message that we've been hearing throughout this, um, this, this talk has really been highlighting the critical importance of partnerships across sectors, and also um, the importance of developing holistic approaches. I think for nonprofits like the Nature Conservancy, WWF, and others, a critical role that they bring to the table often is helping to develop the science underlying the nature-based features, helping to show how to prioritize where you get the greatest benefits for doing restoration that will give you the greatest risk reduction and co-benefits. I think other, um, other key functions are um, some of what we heard about in terms of the community engagement piece of those participatory processes so that all of the stakeholders are able to come together and shape the solutions collaboratively so that they address and meet the needs of all of the partners that are coming to the table. I think another key piece 
um, in terms of mainstreaming nature-based uh, solutions across multiple sectors is really elevating um, the lessons learned in knowledge sharing so that we're not recreating the wheel in different geographies. I mean, for me, a big lesson here was that you know, we have over a thousand pages of, of knowledge and case studies and expertise, and I still feel like we're at the tip of the iceberg with implementing these projects globally. Um, we have so much work to do um, to move forward the best practices, to develop new communities of practice, um, and to share those across the partners. So I think for me, it was a really exciting opportunity, but very humbling to see um, the great opportunities that we have ahead, and knowing that it's going to take everybody, all of the folks that contributed to this effort, um, really a sustained commitment going forward to bring those skills together and really show how we can elevate this and get these projects implemented to scale. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for that, Lizzie. I mean, it, it takes a lot of different people, a lot of different organizations to pull the wagon of progress. <laughs> and, and, and organizations are, I think, continually learning, certainly leading organizations are continually learning on how to work with other organizations and organizations of other types. And I, I think, this area, as has been reflected in our conversation relative to nature-based solutions, is particularly primed or ripe, if you will, for this idea of working across organizations because there is so much diversity of value to be found and to be developed within nature-based solutions. So I, I appreciate very much your participation and leadership in the guidelines effort and the Nature Conservancy and our partner with, partnership with them in engineering with nature. Thank you, Lizzie. Well, last but not least, uh, Brendan Youngman. So Brendan, I learned a lot from you uh, about the work that you and the World Bank are doing around the world on nature-based solutions during the Engineering with Nature podcast that we did together uh, this past spring. And the need worldwide for infrastructure projects that reduce risks and harm from natural hazards is large, monumental, and growing. From your point of view, what's the future outlook on opportunity to leverage Mother Nature, if you will, to address the needs of people and communities around the world? Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Todd, and thanks for dragging me into the, the world of the podcasts. It was, it was my first time, and it was a good experience. It's great to see you and the, the rest of the team behind this effort in, in one place, and I really want to repeat also congratulations uh, for, for leading this effort. Now, as you know, the World Bank as an institution has a mission to what we say, we fight poverty and, and increase shared prosperity. And as part of that, it's really that we try to help countries reduce their risk to climate disasters, since since those are really the events that push people into poverty and uh, get them trapped in that uh, poverty cycle. So as our global director, Samay earlier noted, we have an increase in demand for nature-based solutions from clients uh, globally. And in settings very, you know, ranging from dense urban environments in Africa, uh, today we have another meeting with the government in Tajikistan to look at uh, to look at the NDS for mountain zones in, in desert environments. So the main reason for the demand, I think, is that multi-beneficial nature that we talked about a lot compared to you know gray infrastructure, as we say, we 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 can generate these co-benefits for communities, biodiversity, and the local economy. I do think that you know making these benefits actually materialize uh, and making MBS an option in those very complex settings that we work in is, is not straightforward, uh, and it requires the right tools and guidance, principles, uh, and also a lot of capacity building that uh, that was mentioned by Anita as well. So if we are to implement those nature-based features with our client countries, we need to also make sure that they are robust, they're sustainable, and they effectively address the problems so that the people are facing on the ground. So. For my sense, before the development of these guidelines that we're launching today, there was still a big gap in speaking to government staff, engineers, consulting firms to reintegrate nature-based approaches to the level of detail that we can undertake a feasibility study, engineering designs, and actually put this in place in these different environments. And this is a key contribution that I see of these guidelines to go beyond the strategic and really go, you know, go from the desks to the to really to, to the mud, basically. So yeah, over the next years, I expect I'll be doing more and not, not less of NBS. And I think that these guidelines will really help us get to the, to the nitty gritty and develop better projects. And I do join everyone who mentioned that the work is maybe not starting now, but uh, maybe we're halfway now. And we have many guidance documents out there and the trick will be to work together and actually bring these 
uh, to implementation. And I'm really looking forward to, to working with everyone here to see how we how far we can push that. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much, Brendan. I I I I wholly agree with you that you know there's lots of work to done. This, in a sense, is is a beginning point, not the singular beginning point, since we've made made you know reference many times that there are examples of these projects in place that go back a hundred years or more. But it it does pr provide us, I think, the guidelines, a focal point for us to do even more together uh, in the future. And I appreciate so much the work the World Bank is doing around the world. And as you point out, there are many different contexts around the world, physical contexts, as well as cultural contexts that need you know, solutions. And they do need to be, in a sense, tailored, right? You can't pick up a solution from one context and in a completely different context to say, hey, let me put this you know, solution down over here and expect it to work. So I think organizations like the World Bank and, and others within our group can can help us sense these different contexts and and uh, and make progress together. I I appreciate uh, your participation today. Thank you very much, Brendan. And and I do want to thank each of you, our panelists, and your respective organizations again for helping us advance nature-based solutions. We've reached the closing phase of our international launch event uh, today, and I have a few final thoughts to share with you. There are many sources of inspiration in life and work. Some in the audience know that I hit the road, as we sometimes say, this summer and traveled over 5,000 miles across the heartland of America, visiting projects, places, and people, and then sharing what I saw, heard, and thought in what we called engineering with nature on the road. One of the places and projects that I visited in the state of Oklahoma was the Robert S. Kerr Reservoir Lock and Dam, an Army Corps of Engineers project that was officially opened and dedicated in a ceremony in 1970 where former President Lyndon Johnson actually spoke. The Kerr Reservoir is co-located with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services Sequoia National Wildlife Refuge. 20,000 acres of river floodplain habitat that supports 250 migratory bird species in addition to other habitat for other species. This is an example of a place where we have infrastructure and nature together. And we have certainly learned a lot about how to combine infrastructure and nature together for mutual reinforcing benefit over the last 50 years. Robert Kerr was, uh, for whom the reservoir was named, was the governor of the state of Oklahoma from 1943 to 1947. And he served in the U.S. Senate from 1949 to 1963. The period of drought experienced in Oklahoma and the Southern Plains in the United States during the Dust Bowl days of the 1930s was followed by severe flooding of the Arkansas River in 1943. And, and this range of events over a relatively short period of time were strong motivators for the Senator's leadership in the area of conservation and water resources development during his tenure in the Senate. He actually published a book on the subject in 1960 by the title of Land, Wood, and Water. And he wrote in the opening lines of this book, quote, ever since I was a boy on the frontier, the wonders of nature have awed and inspired me. My father cultivated this taste, coining the rhythmic, rhythmic phrase of land, wood, and water. As I grew to manhood with broader horizons, I realized that the trio of natural wealth is the foundation of all prosperity and essential to a better way of life everywhere. He continued by offering a broad challenge and promise to all of us 
when he wrote this. It is in our power, under the watchful eyes of God, to determine the physical form of the world in which we live. We can make it a paradise of land, wood, and water, or by neglect, permit it to become a desert. The choice is ours. In closing, I want to thank everyone who collaborated in the development of the NMBF guidelines. It was the pleasure of a career to be a part of it. To the more than 70 organizations and 170 people who contributed in many different ways, thank you. To the organizations that organized and hosted our working meetings, thank you. When people have opportunities to substantively engage across all boundaries around a common goal, great things happen. To the authors of the guidelines who were committed to sharing their knowledge and experience with others, thank you. And to the editorial board members for their extra level of engagement in this effort, thank you. Special thanks too to Jeff King, Courtney Chambers, Jonathan Sim, Ram Mohan, and Zelini Hubbard and your teammates, well done, everyone. We hope you find the guidelines beneficial to your work on flood risk management challenges and your pursuit of opportunities to create diverse and enduring value through infrastructure and to create a better future for our communities. The guidelines are available to you now in an electronic form on our website at engineeringwithnature.org. Thank you for being here. The future is bright with opportunity.